Uh, today we're going to look at uh, Pilate's statement uh, to Jesus as he is on trial. And it's one of my favorite moments where we see Jesus on trial uh, and Pilate talking to Jesus. And it, we have this courtroom type scene. So you have this, uh, if you can hear the uh, dum dum from uh, Law and Order going on, uh, you've got the right kind of feel and the right kind of setting for what we're looking at. And so we're at Easter, uh, just a couple days away from Good Friday here on Wednesday. Uh, and technically, if you read the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John for theological purposes, moves Jesus' trial and crucifixion up one day compared to the others. And the reason for that is to match Jesus um, theologically up with the Passover lamb so that Jesus is sacrificed with the Passover lamb. And so John moves Jesus over the whole situation, the whole passion narrative over one day. So tomorrow, Thursday... If you're watching this live, if you're watching this recorded, it may not be Thursday tomorrow for you, but uh, tomorrow would be Thursday, which would be the day that Jesus is on trial before Pilate. So we're going to be in John 18, and what I want to do is I want to take just a moment and talk about the importance of truth before we get there, and to understand John 18, you actually have to go to John 10. So we're going to be looking at all those passages today as we stare at uh, kind of the last week of Jesus, and specifically today, the trial of Jesus. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to talk about truth for just a second. And the question would be, how do we know truth? Uh, there are self-evident laws of logic known as first principles, uh, which are proven by other principles inherent to nature and the reality, uh, and thus are self-evident. Uh, and what we mean by that is is that you and I exist. We know that we exist. Uh, there are people who challenge the idea that we exist, and I love Re Ravi Zacharias always responds whenever he's doing a Q&A and he gets the question, uh, how do we know we exist? And he responds with, and who should I say is asking the question, who do we exist? Uh, and so we exist is a self-evident uh, truth that we believe in. Uh, again, if you don't believe you exist, that's okay, but we're probably not going to move much further into the conversation because you can't even be sure that you exist. Now, there are other self-evident truths uh, that we know from our senses, from our eyes, from our hands, and certainly you could argue that we can be fooled, that we can have uh, experiences in which we can't trust our eyes and our senses, but on the most cases, that is not the truth, and those are self-evident truths. All right? uh, and so what we want to do is talk about is truth important? Because we live in a culture where truth is relevant, uh, where you have a truth and I have a truth, and which is ironic to say because then you have to ask, is that truth always true? Is your truth and my truth always going to be different? Is your truth and my truth always going to be juxtaposed? Or what if they line up? Then do we have a truth? Or is it not true that you have a truth and I have a truth? Now, I don't mean to spend your head in, spin your head in circles and give you kind of riddles for a second. I'm just wanting you to understand how the culture views this concept of truth and how the culture uses this, this concept of truth in which we live in a, a culture that's really been influenced by mid Middle Eastern uh, theology, if you will, uh, that there's a, an and or, or an either or, and that there can be this and there can be that. We can have both, but nobody really lives that way. Nobody really lives that way. So let me give you a couple places where truth exists, and it's important to help you understand that truth exists, and it's important in all places. Uh, and some of this comes from Frank Turek, and I want to give him credit uh, with the, the I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. <clears throat> but he would explain that uh, if you struggle to believe in truth, go to your bank teller and say to your bank teller, I'd like to make a withdrawal of $100,000. Uh, when your bank teller types up your information and looks up at you and kind of smiles and says, uh, ma'am or sir, you don't have $100,000, uh, you can simply say to him, well, that's your truth, but mine is that I do, and just see how that's going to go for you. All right, is truth important in that situation? Absolutely, absolutely truth is important. What if uh, you're pulled over by an officer? 
You're going down the road. It happens. You're going like 60 and a uh, 50 or 45, and you forgot that that was the speed limit or you were in a hurry. And the officer pulls you over. He comes up to your car, taps on the window. You roll it down, and the officer says, uh, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, excuse me, sir. Did you know that you were going uh, 60 and a 45? Uh, your response could simply be, well, that's your truth. How's that going to work for you? <laughs> yeah, it's not, right? <clears throat> because as much as we want to live saying that, that, well, truth doesn't exist, truth doesn't matter, there are cases where clearly it does matter. Going to a doctor, you've just been diagnosed with uh, a cancer. And the doctor says, uh, you know, you've been diagnosed with cancer, it doesn't look good. And you say to the doctor, is there any hope? Is there is there a chance that there's some drugs out there that, uh, you know, might help, might be a solution? <clears throat> and if the doctor says to you, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you have a truth and I have a truth. And, and somebody say, may say these drugs that could help you, but I, I'm not going to say these drugs can help you because, well, again, whose truth is relevant here? Again, you're going to immediately say, I need a new doctor, right? Because you're going to want, A, first of all, to go, hey, is your diagnosis of my cancer real or is that something that you made up? Then you're going to want to know, hey, is – is there really any medical help for my situation out here? Let me give you a, a, another example. Uh, say to your child, I love you. Is that true? Again, we could say that we can know it's true because our actions will live that out. But the reality of it is when somebody says I love you to you, you want to know that it's true. You want it to be true. It's important that that moment be true. How much more in life are statements of truth important when we then talk about our eternal existence? What I mean by that is, is we have earthly situations where we say these statements of truth are extremely important. Because they impact whether I'm getting a speeding ticket, whether or not I have money in the bank, whether or not I'm going to get money out of the bank, whether or not I'm going to continue to live because I've been diagnosed with cancer. We have those situations here on earth that when we take them in context, we go, these are extremely important conversations and the truth there matters. When we talk about our eternity, truth matters even more. Now, one more level as to why this is important is because you can read uh, individuals like uh, Deepak Chopra, I think I say his name correctly, uh, who's kind of the uh, Middle Eastern guru right now. And he has an entirely different take on Jesus than what you and I do. And what I mean by that is when you read his writings, this, again, this is a guy who, uh, when we went to coronavirus, uh, he got on the... Uh, major networks and gave a moment of of prayer and meditation, which is fascinating to me because he's not really praying to anybody. He's just meditating, ultimately praying to uh, some form of energy out there. But but when he writes about Jesus, in fact, he's written a book about Jesus. It has no truth claims in it, or should say very few truth claims in it. Uh, in fact, we have a whole different story of Jesus when we read his book. And so I have to ask the question, does truth matter? In fact, Jesus is going to take this to the extreme next level when he says, look, if you believe in truth, you will know me. Now, you and I look at that and read this in just a moment, and we're going to go, yeah, I believe in Jesus, therefore I understand what he's saying. But what he's really saying is that if you don't believe and put your whole trust in me, then you don't really know truth. Now that's a powerful statement. Because, again, we live in a culture and a world where immediately, uh, in fact, you may be listening right now and you may go, I don't believe. And you may go, well, see, you're, you're just very arrogant. You exclude all other religions. You exclude all other possibilities because of what Jesus said. Well, in a way that's true, but I don't exclude them. Jesus did. Jesus' statements over and over and over and over and over and over and over again to say, I am the only way. So if you say to me, if you're objecting to me, how can you be so arrogant? How can you exclude all these other religions? How can you say that everybody else is, is wrong? 
I would simply respond with you, I don't. But Jesus did. Jesus claimed to be the only way. Therefore, we have to wrestle with Jesus' truth statements. And either Jesus was a liar, which even uh, Deepak Chopra doesn't do, or we have to say that Jesus did tell the truth, and therefore, therefore, I must surrender who I am to him and put my whole trust in him. At this point in time, Frank Turek might say to you that uh, if if you could find out, if you could have it proved to you that Christianity were true, would you believe? Would you put your faith in it? Would you trust Jesus if we could prove to you Christianity were true? And he argues that the majority of people don't stay away from Christianity or don't avoid Christianity because they find errors in it or because it's not true or because the evidence isn't there. But rather, most people stay away from Christianity because they don't want to live into the moral obligations that Jesus sets up for them. Does that make sense? Okay, let's start with John 10 for just a moment. If you have a Bible, you want to go with me to John 10. This is actually the backdrop, ironically, for Jesus' trial. Uh, It's Jesus when he speaks of himself as the good shepherd. You ready? Uh, John 10, uh, verse 1. Very truly, there's the word true again. I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters the gate is a shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate to him, and the sheep hear his voice. And listen to this. It's so comforting. It's so beautiful. When you wonder, does God care? Does God know that I'm hurting? Is God with me? Listen, Jesus calls his own sheep by name. He knows your name. And he knows your name, Aaron, different than Aaron over here, different than Aaron over here, different than Aaron over here. He knows you. And he leads them out. He doesn't leave them on their own. He leads them out. When he's brought out all of his own and goes ahead of them, the sheep follow him. Why do they follow him? Because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger, but they'll run from a stranger. It says that Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying. So Jesus said again to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Now, this is interesting. Uh, A shepherd would literally lay down in what would be, you might have a wall right here and here, and the shepherd would, right here and here, for the show camera, sorry. Uh, And the shepherd would lay down in the opening, and at the opening then, the shepherd would literally be the gate. You would have to walk over the shepherd to get out, or if a, a wolf or a coyote or some other creature wanted to get in to harm the sheep, it would have to go literally over or through the shepherd when he says, I am the gate. Uh, whoever enters by me will be saved. That's a pretty exclusive statement that Jesus just made. I am the only way. Whoever enters by me, not through another way, will be saved. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. It's interesting there that you see the devil's order uh, that you steal, kill, and destroy. Most of the time when I think of the way the order should be, it should be steal, destroy, and kill. Uh, But rather when when we understand the work of the devil, we understand that there are things worse than death. Jesus says as much later, uh, I came that they may have life and life more abundantly. Again, Jesus over and over again in the Gospel of John is described as the light and is also described as the life. And you can't have life apart from Jesus. He is the bread of life. He is the water of life. You can't have life apart from Jesus. Jesus over and over again makes these exclusive claims. I am the only. Now again, you don't have to argue with me. You don't have to say, hey, Aaron's arrogance. Aaron's arrogant. Aaron has... And this kind of worldview where he, he sees only Christianity and knows only Christianity. I've studied other religions. All I'm simply saying to you is that you're arguing with Jesus. You can say, I'm crazy, I'm a fool, and that's fine. But Jesus has made these claims, not me. And so, again, to say, I'm not going to believe, ultimately means that you're calling Jesus a liar. That Jesus isn't telling the truth here. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He goes on to talk about how uh, in verse 18, he says, I'm going to lay down my life for my sheep. He says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I lay it down on my own accord. 
Now, he's predicting his death here coming up as the good shepherd. Now, pause as we move into uh, John 18. What we have to understand is that the reason we start here, first of all, is that Jesus is going to kind of draw back and pick up imagery from this. But we also have to start here because uh, the good shepherd who is understood to be the pastor or the king of Israel. Again, the king of Israel was to be the shepherd. And so when Jesus comes in and says, I'm the good shepherd, he brings about all this kingly and this priestly imagery, uh, all the way back to the time of Moses in which we go, hey, this is the one who is giving us the example of how the ruler should rule, which is really interesting at a time when we have Herod and now his three sons ruling and Pontius Pilate as the uh, ruler of the area by the Roman government. So we have all these political tensions, and here Jesus comes and says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the one who rules the way that it was always meant to be ruled, the one who does what the Father has taught him to do. And so we have Jesus on trial. I'm in John 18. All right, John 18. And we have Jesus has already been brought before King, uh, Caiaphas, and uh, he's now brought into Pilate for uh, kind of the the final piece of the trial. And you want to go back and read a whole section. We have John 18 has Jesus arrest and has Jesus uh, with Peter denying Jesus. And we have this moment where now Jesus is uh, on trial with Pilate, which is fascinating to think that the ruler, the creator of the world is on trial. But this is what it says. Verse 33. Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus to him, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? So Pilate is asking a truth question. Can you tell me your identity? He's gotten a little bit of the story. He enters the headquarters. Now, what you're going to see is there's two scenes. There's kind of outside all right, outside, I keep getting off camera over here. There's outside and there's inside, and Pilate's going to come inside to talk to Jesus and go outside to talk to the Jews. And so uh, John, very cinematic, has two settings that you're going to see the action go back and forth from. Uh, and so Pilate comes inside and asks Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says to him, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Now, this is where, as parents, we get a little upset because it's like, this is a yes and no question, Jesus. <laughs> like, Just give me the answer. I don't need the story. I don't need the whys. I don't need the how. I don't need the background. But Jesus responds ultimately with a question to the question. And so the question is, are you the king of Jews? Jesus' answer simply should be, could be, is actually, yes, I am. But the Jews, and I don't mean this as an anti-Semitic statement, because the Romans and everybody else except for the disciples and the Gentiles who are later going to follow him. So this isn't anti-Semitic. This is simply the Jews at the time, the leading rulers of the Jewish community, have rejected Jesus, all right, and they want him crucified. Pilate's about to reject Jesus, so he's not Pilate's king either. And so what we have is that uh, Pilate says to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? And so Jesus is actually getting to the point where he says, You tell me, Pilate, is it a truth statement that I'm the king of the Jews, or did someone else tell you this? Pilate replies, I'm not a Jew. There are some movies and shows that try to make Pilate a sympathizer to Jesus or Pilate kind of a weakling to the Jews. But what you see out of the Gospel of John is probably the most accurate picture of John that of Pilate rather that aligns with history. And that Pilate doesn't care about the Jews at all, nor does he really care about Jesus. But this is a political game for Pilate right now. Uh, but certainly we don't think Pilate wants to have an innocent man hanged or put on the cross, as we'll find out in just a moment. And Pilate says, I'm not a Jew, am I? Really? I'm not a Jew, so why are you asking me? This is your people. Are you their king or not? Your own nation and your chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Now, the implication is that Jesus obviously has done something wrong. It's like the parent who walks into the room, everything is spilled all over the floor and says, and what happened here, right? There's got to be a good explanation. Jesus answered this way. Now, this is interesting. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers 
which is the same word, by the way, that's used for chief of the temple uh, guards, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And so Jesus is stating that my authority, my power, doesn't rest on this earth. Wow, that's a pretty big statement. Like, I don't know anybody, no prophet, no teacher, no preacher today who says, hey, actually my authority is from heaven. And we all go, yeah, that's believable, right? But we have a rule. Anytime someone can predict their own death and resurrection and pull it off, we should do whatever they say. Therefore, we have to take Jesus' words seriously. Verse 37. Verse 37. All right, Pilate says to him, so you are a king. So you are a king. Hmm. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my Voice. Now suddenly stop. Did you see the suddenly connection all the way back to the, the John 10 passage where my sheep know my voice? He's asking if he's the king. The king is to behave as a good shepherd. And Jesus suddenly references his own speech out of John 10, which John records, that my people, my sheep, my followers, they will listen to my voice. Why? Because they know I tell the truth. He says then, uh, for I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. I testify. My life is a testimony to truth. And everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Now, this is a powerful and very, very, very cutting statement because ultimately Jesus is saying here, look, if you don't put your trust in me, if you don't put your hope in me, if you don't gamble all in on me, then you're not living in the truth. You're living for the things of this world, which will soon disappear. You're living for a lie. Now, again, we must go back to Frank Turk's question. If Christianity were proven to be true, would you believe it? Would you follow? Would you change your heart? Would you say, for now on, I'm going to chase after God and live God's way? Or can you at least be honest and say, you know what? I believe it's true. I just don't want to live into what Jesus has called me to do. Now, the secret there is that you're actually missing the true joy in life that Jesus offers. I mean, aren't you tired of chasing after stuff that seems to be like sand going through your fingers? You can never grab happiness. You can never grab joy. You can never grab the fulfillment that you want. Aren't you tired of, of the next thing being the biggest thrill and then that big thrill letting you down? Isn't there a place in your soul that longs for peace, that longs for truth? I mean, after all, what's a life built on a lie? A lie that says, I get to be in charge. I get to be my own God. I get to choose what's right and wrong. But that's not really real. I mean, we have government systems that tell you that's not really true. We have political systems that tell you that's not really true. We have insurance systems. We have uh, officers. We have parents. We have grandparents. We have your neighbors. All these people injecting their ideas of what's right and wrong into your life. You're never really your own God. You never really get to choose what's right and wrong. And aren't you tired of the hollow feeling in your stomach as you try to live that way then along comes jesus and says i am the truth if you want to know truth you have to follow me if you want your life to mean something if you want to get back on track with the purpose to what i created you i jesus created you then you have to follow me Pilate stops him and asks him this amazing question of verse 38 that is so true for our culture and our society. But what is truth? What is truth? The irony is that Pilate is asking the truth, what is the truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Pilate is now asking the truth, what is the truth? Here before him, Pilate has the king of all creation and has to ask him, are you the king? Why? Because Pilate doesn't see it. Now Pilate says, what is the truth? And before him stands the truth of all creation. But he doesn't see it. Why? Because he's missing out on what's before him, which is the truth. 
Hey, as we head into Easter, I invite you to pause for just a second. I invite you to investigate the claims of Christianity. I invite you to investigate the claims of all the world religions. Why? Because when you have truth, you're not afraid of what somebody else is going to run off and find. But I invite you to take what Jesus said very seriously. And what I mean by that is that no other world religion identifies Jesus' truth claims and wrestles with them in an honest way that they have to say either Jesus is a lunatic, a liar, or he's God. Those are your only two options. And so I say to you, investigate it all. Look at it. Take this search seriously because ultimately your eternity is a gamble on the answer to this question. Is Jesus true? Is what he says true? And if the answer is yes, then we must surrender everything to him, which changes everything about the way we live and believe and ultimately leads you to true joy. Because for the first time in your life, you may be living into your purpose. And it's only when we live into what we were created to be that we're able to experience true joy. Have a blessed day, my friends. I look forward to seeing you Good Friday. Remember, we'll be back Good Friday, 7 p.m. We want you to get your own communion. If you want to go Catholic and get wine, that's in your house. Do what you want. Uh, for those of you that want to practice uh, uh, less Catholic communion, uh, we're and I don't mean that in a slander at all. We're going to do grape juice, and so get your own bread and grape juice and have it available with us at 7 p.m. on Friday. Uh, and we're going to invite you to do uh, a worship service with us uh, live here on Facebook and YouTube. God bless you guys. Have a great day.